Chapter Seven of the Pathway of the Pioneer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pathway of the Pioneer by Dolph Willard. Chapter Seven. Perplexed in faith but pure in deeds, at last we beat our music out. There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. We fought our doubts and gathered strength. We would not make our music blind we faced the spectres of the mine and laid them thus we come at length alfred tennyson it being sunday evening nous ultra assembled early for one may be late on saturday night if one's landlady is good-natured breakfast in bed on sunday morning following as a matter of course but it is well to go to bed early on sunday and to begin the hateful monday morning which leads the week's work with all the strength that rest can give the girls began to arrive after tea and by seven they were all assembled hilda romaine was the last to come she had been to visit old friends that afternoon in order to escape the discomforts of her home for she was the only one of nous autres who had hardly a corner to call her own sometimes she had the small room apportioned to her in her father's house to herself but more often one of the children who were her stepsisters shared it and hilda went abroad to seek peace and quietness as she had said she was very strong otherwise the strain both abroad and at home would have broken her down long since even as it was it had added a kind of tragic patience to her beauty that lay like a shadow on her and detracted from her youth service was beginning at some of the churches as she made her way strandwards towards flair's rooms by the time hilda passed st stephen's with the sword the congregation had reached the first hymn and were pouring a full volume of sound out into the quiet street she paused a minute and listened wistfully for it had been a hard day a day of fret and jar and the misery of little things that go to make life intolerable some comfort might lie in the hymn whose tune is familiar to thousands but to poor hilda pausing on the road of fate it came with dreadful meaning mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war she did not hear the congregation reach the next line she turned with the words dinned into her ears and swung along as to the rhythm of her own despair mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war a man stared in her face in passing and half turned to follow her the girl lifted her head fiercely and a storm of passion flushed her from brow to chin colouring the mask of the apollo belvedere like an angry sunset if he had spoken to her she felt as if she would have struck him and she was thankful that in front of her was the little passage leading nowhere but to flair's door and a few others up which she turned and lost her follower hilda cried over her temper in secret and prayed against it openly she thought it her gravest fault r l was sitting on the doorstep as she came in having been for a stroll and seeming rather annoyed that he should have to wait at his own house to be admitted hilda leaned down to stroke him with a sudden sense of comfort in the warm friendly thing and he rose on his hind feet and lifted his ringed paws to the handle of the door he could rattle the door handles of the inner rooms and make flair open to him at any time even in the middle of a manuscript and this was his way of adjuring hilda to make haste i can't old boy we must both wait for mrs bonnet she explained and they were still talking when the landlady admitted them i will take r l in with me thanks mrs bonnet hilda said i expect miss caldecott is looking for him she always do be said the landlady in a tone resigned to flair's lunacy he's an ansome cat i must say she added with the faint pride of distant ownership though why you all calls im arold miss i can't think it's an odd name for a cat we call him r l mrs bonnet arold did you say miss well that's odder still lor arold is a name and the other ain't but i always thinks you says arold 
r l with an appearance of faint disgust cut short the discussion on his name by trotting down the passage to the packing-case room there he pushed the door open with his head which was his strongest point his paws were rather small and weak for his size so that he hesitated to trust his heavy body to them when he jumped and never used them to paw a door open like most of his kind but his head and shoulders were massive and seemed hard as well he fought with his head butting his adversary over and then he sat down on the poor thing and trusted to wait to knock the breath out of it most of the cats in the neighbourhood being strays and consequently thin r l had pretty well fought and conquered for many housetops round flair was lying in the long deck-chair with her feet up for no claim of being more tired than her friends but because she was naturally lymphatic for reasons of physique and they one and all indulged her she really had a weaker constitution than any of them for she took her health as a grim inheritance from a worn-out stock and tendencies from hardships or excesses begun in the crusades handicapped poor flair for the perpetual effort which she found life everything was an effort from getting up in the morning to taking off her clothes at night and unfortunately it was a conscious one but the reward to flair was the stretching of her small soft body on the hard mattress and the delicious sense of going to sleep it was no wonder that she thought of heaven as nothing but the end of a long day and if she could have afforded such a holiday she would have had a debauch of sleep rather than any dissipation awake she saw the cat as he came in but characteristically sat still and called to him instead of getting up to greet hilda hello r l been killing any more cats what a row you were making on the leads this morning i know it was you i recognized the stifled scream of the victim sing unto r l for he hath bruised the tail of his enemies he was sitting quite peaceably on the doorstep when i came up said hilda tossing her hat into the further room without troubling to go in and mrs bonnet asked me why we all call him arold how lovely murmured beatrice with a flash of laughter that lightened her gloomy eyes arold poor old r l how insulted he looks it is as bad as mistaking a montmorency for a morris what made you late hilda frank said affectionately looking at the unusual gravity in hilda's face frank observed through sympathy where all magda's and flair's journalistic training failed them we thought you had gone to church i don't go to church very often do i said hilda with unusual curtness in her memory a hidden congregation was singing as if in hideous mockery mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war none of us go to church dear we are all heathens nous autres winnie's laugh was the daintiest scoff we rise late and mend our stockings and break the sabbath in every way no wonder flair gets letters from unknown correspondents warning her of things to come no did she asked alma with interest tell me i suppose i was on tour it was last autumn frank said laughing you were in south america i think alma flair had been writing for some magazine or other which offered a prize and printed her name and address she got the prize for her story but the consequence was that somebody sent her a religious paper with copious notes in the margin pointing out how it applied what was that about the ark beatrice oh one paragraph implored the reader to take refuge in the ark and used other biblical similes about the wrath to come but what we liked was that the lady evidently thought that flair was not among the saved for she added in a footnote those who stay outside will be swept away by the deluge we have all been expecting to find flair and r l swimming for their lives ever since commented magda the ark was a happy simile though in connection with flair i believe that she would cheerfully sail with noah for the sake of having a zoological gardens on board it would suit me too said alma placidly flair and i both love beasts pass the sigs tricks not until you have afforded them their last two syllables beatrice said sternly 
alma's economy in words threatening to become a mania and causing the rest of nuzotra to groan if left to herself her speech would soon have been a language of its own and even as it was it was hard to prevent her saying circs for circumstances prov for providence prop per property etc while of such excursions into originalities as dotnitudes by which she meant silliness i e dotty and if baths to express small things of no importance it was hopeless to try to cure her alma was the sort of girl who has a pet name for her umbrella and keeps her bicycle's birthday well people may call us heathens said beatrice almost defiantly but we have a religion if it is only to stick to each other a chuckle came from the deck chair beatrice definition seems the religion of lumps of toffee said flair look here solomon don't lie there and listen and then jeer said frank indignantly get up and preach us a sermon it's sunday evening here somebody heave her out of that deck chair yes do something for your living said magda coolly reaching over and taking possession of flair's claret which she held out of reach flair made a grab but the pretty white hand held it firmly above her ruffled head and a general chorus demanded ransom of her they dragged her out of her chair and she went good-humouredly enough and stood behind it her arms resting on the back her masculine eyes looking at no one in particular until the group had settled down magda with a perverse smile on her lips frank listening with kindly attention winnie drawing the cigarette smoke luxuriously through her fine nostrils beatrice curled up on the ground at alma's feet hilda sitting alone near the window her eyes still straying to the outside world her thoughts half distracted by the line of a hymn tune mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war so flair stood up and preached there are only two sermons really worth listening to and they are the sermon on the mount and the christmas sermon and i am neither jesus christ nor robert louis stevenson i cut rather a sorry figure stood up here to speak to you and to be laughed at i have no text because i don't believe that a text ever appealed to more than a handful of people and one may not get the handful together the only subjects on which one can speak are the generalities incident to that sphere of life in which god help us we find ourselves and they are artificial with artificial laws to which we have all tacitly subscribed by belonging to the community and depending on the police and therefore it is these generalities that must matter to us all whatever our temperaments and don't you forget it it is the fashion nowadays to sneer at respectability i don't know why i am sure unless it is because so few people are respectable dullness and dowdiness are two reproaches generally hurled at it but what it really means is endurance and restraint do you remember the older phrase which was superseded by the term a respectable woman an honest woman you will hear the poor use it to-day i am an honest woman for the more bourgeois i am a respectable and generally added married woman but it means the same thing honest the woman who pays her rent which means that she denies herself to keep a roof over her head and not live in the streets the woman who does not drink or take drugs or fall into any self-indulgence for all the despair that sweeps over her in this hard life of ours the woman who does not cheat even to take advantage of her neighbour for all the temptation of excuse that she owns that is being honest or respectable just which you will of course the more recognised application of the word lies in the curse of sex which pursues us all every man jack of us death waits at all the street corners one may say and you never know when your time may come if you allow yourself to think about it just so also sex pursues nous ultra and dogs are footsteps in the filthiest forms if we look to the right hand or the left well the respectable woman is the woman who respects herself and the woman who does that 
never need fear anything beyond the most elementary of street insults which is hardly to be noticed and is easily kicked into the gutter from which it came on an average we are too intent on our own purposes as we go about the streets to even hear if a man speaks to us and the woman who is obviously going somewhere on her own business is as safe in all but neighbourhoods proclaimed as murderous as if she drove in a carriage with an escort of the lifeguards whoever loiters on the roads of life will be accosted by every idler bent on mischief to be busy is to be armed at all points and indeed there is no safeguard like conventionality no path so comfortable for a woman as the sure safe one of respectability that it is deadly dull carries the consolation with it of having endured and that it is dowdy is no reproach in this age of cheap finery believe me it is only the people who have not been bohemians by necessity who look upon bohemia as an enchanted land it means not having enough to eat and having to trudge footsore and seeing your own face in the glass grow haggard and ugly doesn't it girls besides the liberty of which people who don't know speak so enviously besides what advantage is it to me though i can go out now and walk the streets till midnight if i choose and accept any invitation anywhere that is offered to me the consequences would probably be deucedly unpleasant and i would far rather that my brother if i had one were with me to knock any one down who became a nuisance no there is a lot of nonsense talked about independence who wants to be independent we would much rather that our fathers had made our living for us and left us independent of the world through being dependent on them but since they haven't done it we must make the best of our own heads and hands only it is rather hard that we should be envied nous autres rather than pitied as we deserve respectability conventionality it is easy to have a fling at such outward signs of keeping the law by those who want to indulge themselves and break it i never hear a man's cheap sneer against a woman's love of conventionality but i know that he is smarting under a sense of defeat somebody or other has proved honest enough to refuse to help him to evade his own obligations and he who openly proclaims himself a rebel under the law it sounds rather a fine thing when self-described as not accepted by society is simply offering an excuse for his own weakness and dissipation social laws were found to be and made as a necessary restraint in a state of civilized society unless you are ready to face the disadvantage of savagery why should you hark back to its questionable freedom and why should you be privileged rather than another for the greatest libertine considers the decalogue necessary to keep the majority in order it is only his noble self that he accepts one of the greatest pitfalls in following an example or a recognized though unwritten law is our very human tendency to contrast downwards and not upwards i know no more subtle temptation than that excuse of being no worse than one's neighbour but everybody does that now and no one thinks anything of it one hears the protest on every side and unfortunately it is true though why on earth we should regard that as any reason for doing a thing that has to bear such an excuse i can't say personally i am too conceited if only i take time to think about it for the fact that another fellow is in my eyes a cad generally causes me to put my nose in the air and say then i thank my god i'm a gentleman and i'm not capable of doing likewise which may be pride but it's a damned useful quality i beg your pardon hilda and yours magda the others won't mind there i've done and the best of a layman's preaching is that any of you can get up and contradict me i know no more irritating thing than having to sit under a pulpit 
with a priest uttering doctrinal platitudes which he takes it for granted that you take for granted and you can't get up and say well i don't believe that to begin with because and state your honest reasons you can't even get up and walk out because it isn't courteous and the clergy always seem to start with a conviction that no one in the congregation has either read or thought anything at all on the subjects on which they consider themselves authorities whereas most of us i hope have honoured our religion by giving it more of our earnest consideration than other subjects which is one reason why i never go to church for if a man thinks that i am a fool without finding out i am pretty sure that he is one and flair sat down and put her feet up in the deck-chair again as coolly as she had risen whereat nuzotra laughed good-humouredly and clapped her which is a better reception than that given to many sermons for she was honest if not eloquent and she tried to live up to her convictions when she was settled she took a long draught of the claret and soda returned to her by magda who patted the curly head at the same time very good little girl she said patronizingly now you have earned it you may have your intoxicating liquor you would have to drink about a bottle before it went to your head said Winnie scornfully there is no harm in flair's claret did you dine out last night alma leaned forward to ask in a low tone yes champagne or hock champagne and liqueur do you really think forms and ceremonies a good thing flair said hilda turning from the window to the girl in the deck-chair the poor little body and the face with the horrible eyes that looked as if they remembered all the sins they had seen in former generations i think them an excellent barrier for us said flair beginning a last cigarette do you think they would exist if they had not been ordained for some excellent reason i hate barriers i hate forms and ceremonies winnie sprang to her feet as if suddenly inspired i am tired of being bound down and set to labour like oxen let us have liberty at all events we have got little else hear me proclaim myself emancipated a rebel to law and order if you like have a care dearie frank said gently for alma's eyes had caught fire and beatrice was looking up with parted lips we have two dangerous firebrands there don't preach heretical doctrines winnie i don't care but her impetuously raised hands fell to her sides and she laughed a little hysterically yes i do i care for all of you far more than for myself it's getting late who goes home the parliamentary cry met with a swift laughing echo who goes home who goes home and girl after girl rose until flair was the only one still seated lazily in her deck-chair going to sit up flair said frank stooping to kiss her flair was almost as indifferent as r l to caresses don't be late old lady i shan't it's clean sheets night said flair with a long breath of anticipated pleasure mrs bonnet only allows me them once a fortnight and then it's generally three weeks i love clean sheets more than any other luxury i suppose the king has them every night it's the only thing i really envy him she caught frank round the neck with unexpected responsiveness and whispered go part of the way home with winnie frank why dearie there's somebody waiting if you don't frank had to linger for several minutes to do as she was asked for the other girls were trying to do a new coon step that alma was learning and consequently teaching to them all in turn they came back through the larger room laughing and playing as boisterously as if life were jest rather than grim earnest alma herself setting the time to a ditty just then in vogue which begins with an emphasis on the first note won't you tell your lady love when she'll be a bride sure o oh, sure o oh. now we're all on sure o oh. no one intruded sunday evening on their attention flair lay in the deck-chair and laughed while the chorus stamped itself even down the passage in wild rhythm she could afford to be satisfied for she had noticed that frank had slipped her arm through winnie's fainter in the distance came the closing bars rowing down to texan city going with the tide 
won't you come ashore o shore o and so that's all right for the time being said flare caldecott idly reaching for a half sheet of note-paper lying on the mantelpiece on it were a few long lines some half erased and all nearly illegible she read what she had written and unsheathing her fountain pen which was only second to r l in her most intimate life she scribbled a little more of kurdistan and how he loved the beasts god's helpless whom he places on the earth and says to man through those dumb mouths be kind they tell it in farisha till this day for kurdistan was lord of kanrahar suddenly the pen stopped a troubled uncertainty seemed to fall upon the tired contented figure and flair turned her head as one called to attention there was absolutely no sound save the very faintest hum of the ever live strand borne in through the partly open window so faint a hum that it was merely a sense of unsleeping life but in the girl's face and quite obviously in the haunted eyes was the perception of the shadow she sat for a minute quite still her hand crushing the manuscript then she abruptly scrambled out of the deck-chair and stood on her feet her body tightly strung up not only listening but looking something to judge from her attitude of tortured resistance should have been facing her in the room End of chapter seven